imagine that you are hanging over the edge of a cliff on a rope. You look down below you and it's 300 feet to the canyon floor. You look above you and you see that the rope is starting to unravel and you don't know what's going to happen next. And all of a sudden, up above, at the top of the cliff, you hear a voice. At the same time that you hear this voice, you're also distracted to your right because you see that there's another rope, a fine-looking rope, a strong-looking rope. And you think to yourself, I need to get to that rope. But the voice says, wait, don't do it. I can see from my perspective that if you go over to that rope, it won't hold your weight. Just hold on. I'm going to go to my car. I'm going to get some stuff. I'm going to come right back, and I'm going to save you. I promise. Hold tight. You look up, and the rope continues to unravel. The question this morning is, what do you do? Now, I submit the answer to that question can only be answered if you answer the question, who is at the top of the cliff? Because who is at the top of the cliff and that promise that they have made will determine whether or not you will hang tight or whether or not you'll take things into your own hands. At the top of that cliff, if I'm hanging on that rope and the rope is unraveling, and Hillary Clinton says, hold on, I'll be right back. I'm grabbing the other rope. i got to tell you, I'm just grabbing the other rope. But if it's a person that I know, that I love, that I trust, if it's any one of our elders, if it's many of you sitting here today, and you're at the top of that cliff, and you say, Rich, don't grab the other rope. I know it looks like the way to go, but it's not the way to go. It will not hold you. Stay tight, and I will come back, and I will help you. I promise. If I believe in you, it's not just what you say, but if I believe in you, I believe in your te integrity, your trustworthiness, I will listen to your promise, and I will trust your promise, and I will hold to the rope until you come back to fulfill that promise to me. Trusting the promises of God demonstrates to God not just that we believe what He says, but we believe who He is. Amen? It is a very, very important understanding to have. Because disobedience to God and His ways and His word, this unbelief that results from pushing off the things of God and going my own way, again, is not just a, um, it's not just a statement saying, I don't believe what is being said or what is being promised. It is a statement about who I believe God is and whether I trust Him as a person. The Christmas story is filled with people that were made promises and they believed the promises. I don't know if you've ever noticed that before as you've read through this very familiar stories over and over again. You see a promise made and they believed. A promise made and they believed. Mary believed the angel even though it was a outrageous crazy thing to think that she could become pregnant through the Holy Spirit, and the Messiah would be born uh, from her in that way. It was, it was an unheard of crazy thing for this young woman to think was possible, and yet God told her this is what was going to happen, and she says, let it be done to me, as you said, I'm your servant. She believed. The shepherds in the field, when the angels came and said, there's been one who is born, who is Messiah, who is, who is the Lord, who will forgive men of their sins. The shepherds didn't say, now, let's go and see if this is true. They said, let's go see this thing that has been told to us. And they believed the word of God that had came to them, and they went to see what had been promised. 
The wise men, many, 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 many years ago, down through the centuries, Daniel in Babylon had begun to teach the wise men. Remember, we went through that whole series, um, Letters from Babylon, and, and the leaders and the, the king and the, the wise men, the, the, the magicians there, they thought, we're going to indoctrinate Daniel and his buddies. But what happened was just the opposite. And Daniel began to teach them about the prophecies. He began to teach them about the coming of Messiah. And that was passed down through the generations until finally we see the story here in the Gospels where the wise men come. They believed the promise that was given that one would come, the king of the Jews. And they acted upon that, and they went to seek him. They believed that promise. We find Joseph was told by, in in a dream, he was told by an angel, he was told that, what is happening with Mary is of God. And so, so trust that this is okay. Don't divorce her. And Joseph believed and acted upon that. You see, all the way through Scripture, we find this common thread that God wants His people to trust His Word. Everybody say amen. God wants His people to trust His Word because in trusting God's Word, in trusting God's promise, We are acting in faith, saying, I have faith in his person, in his goodness, in his holiness, in his integrity, in his character. I trust God's word because I trust God. And I know that he will be faithful to bring about what he has promised. Christmas, the birth of Christ, is a promise that took thousands of years to fulfill. We read in the Old Testament many prophecies of of God promising that one day that there would be one who would come. This very familiar passage out of Isaiah, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. And so we see that that God does this incredible thing where where he promises this marvelous thing that, that, that God would become flesh and dwell among men. God with us, Emmanuel. And then we see the fulfillment in Matthew 1, and she shall bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled the promise fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted means God with us. There were those we see through the Scripture that waited and waited patiently on the promise of the Lord to come through. No matter how long it took, they believed in the integrity of God that what God had promised, He would bring to bear. All in His time, all in His way, they didn't understand completely how He was going to do it, but they trusted in the fact that God had made the promise and God was good and God would fulfill what He said. As you go through the Scriptures, it tells the story of God trying to teach Israel that they could count on Him, trying to to get Israel to come to the point where they understood that if God spoke it, they could trust it. All the way uh, recorded through Scripture, we, we see this. We see the primary lesson is God keeps His promises. And so because God keeps His promises, Put your faith in God. Put your faith in what He has said. Now, as you go through the Scripture and you go into the New Testament, I find this really interesting. I find there are three stories in the New Testament that have a common thread that deal with this concept of being able to put all of our weight and all of our trust, all of our faith on the fact that God has given us a promise. These three stories, the first one is actually in the Old Testament. It's the Hebrews wandering in the desert after they were released from Egypt. The second is Jesus in the wilderness temptation, went out into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. 
And the third one is the Lord's Prayer. He taught his disciples how to pray. And so let me briefly go through each one of these and show you something that I think is very interesting and relates to this incredible promise of God become flesh. In the Hebrews, or as to the Hebrews in the desert, the Hebrews were slaves, as you know, in Egypt. And God sends Moses to deliver them. Moses comes and he says this to them. He says, the Lord, the God of your fathers. Now listen to what he is trying to convey to these Hebrew slaves. The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you. What Moses is trying to do, he's trying to communicate to them, is the God who has made covenants with your forefathers has sent me to you to tell you that he is still in covenant with you. That he has still, those ancient promises, he still wants to fulfill them in your life. Those promises that were made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are made to you as well. Those promises to make you into a great people, a nation, to give you a land, to bless the entire earth through you, to protect you, to bless you in abundance. Moses is saying to them, and God is saying to them through Moses, that I have not forgotten you, and I've not forgotten the promises that I've made to your forefathers, and I'm making these promises once again to you. And so you know the story that he led them out of Egypt. He delivered them out of the bondage there in Egypt. And they watched as God displayed his power and brought plagues against the Egyptians until they were finally released and allowed to go. They watched as God caused the Egyptians to be plundered as they gave them food and gold and clothing and they were just packed down with stuff as they marched out of Egypt. They watched God's power perform these things. They watched God defeat Pharaoh's army in the Red Sea as the waters came crashing down upon them and drowned the Egyptian soldiers and, and gave victory to the Hebrews. Then God uses something very, very simple to test their faith. And what he uses is food. He was testing to see whether they believed his word. And he uses food. Exodus 16.1 says, The whole Israelite community set out from Elam and came to the desert of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai. And on the 15th day of the second month after they had come out of Egypt, listen to what it says, in the desert the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat around pots of meat and ate the food that we wanted. But you have brought us out into the desert to starve this entire assembly to death. And so as we look at that, we ask the question, why did God take them out into the desert? Now, there were several reasons that he did, some of them very practical, but there's one very important reason that I want to point out today. Why did God take them out to the desert? He took them out to the desert because there's not much food in the desert. He took them out to the desert because there's not much food in the desert. That was the point. He put them into a place where they didn't have what they felt they needed when they needed it. So that what was in their heart about what they believed about God's promise, God's word, and even God's person would be revealed either by grumbling or through faith. Belief or unbelief is very, very quickly revealed in our lives when we are put in a position where it looks like we don't have what we need. Every single one of us have experienced this. We, uh, you know, it's easy to bebop along when everything is just going fine. 
and we've got money in our pocket, we've got food in the refrigerator, and everything is looking good. But let everything start to go haywire. There is where we find out what is happening on the inside. There is where we find out whether or not we trust God or we do not trust God. Whether in that moment we begin to grumble, what in the world is going on? Where is God? Why is this happening? I don't understand this. Or whether we're people that stop and say, now wait a minute. I know my God is a good God, and I know what He's promised me, and I don't understand exactly what's going on here in my life, but I do know this. I know God will take care of it in the end. Everybody say amen. Watch what they did in the wilderness. Psalm 106, 11, it says, The waters covered their adversaries. That's when God brought the Red Sea to drown the Egyptian soldiers and deliver them. The waters covered their adversaries. Not one of them survived. And then verse 12 says this, Then they believed His promises and they sang His praise. Everybody say amen. amen. But, for, but verse 13 says, But they soon forgot what He had done and did not wait for his counsel. In other words, when things got bad, they just grumbled and complained instead of saying, now, Lord, what is it that you're doing here? What direction do you want me to go? Lead me out of this thing. Lead me into the place you want me to be. Help me to understand how to walk this path right now. Instead of that, they just begin to complain. Verse number 14 says, In the desert they gave in to their cravings. In the wasteland they put God to the test. You see, if they would have believed the promise of God, if they would have believed the covenant made with Abraham, they would have simply said this, I know this, I know that God has promised protection, God has pl promised blessing, God has promised abundance, God has promised all these good things for the future. And I don't know how He's going to do it, but I know He's going to do it. Because I not only believe in what God has said, I believe in who He is, and He is a good God. Everybody say amen. Amen. But they failed to trust God's promise. Uh, Psalm 78, 18 says this, They willfully put God to the test by demanding the food they craved. And they spoke against God, saying, Can God spread a table in the desert? And obviously the implication is they don't think that He can. They had no food, and then God gave them manna. And then they didn't like the manna. They got tired of that, and they wanted better food. This was not about hunger. It was about questioning God's goodness and God's ability to provide for them. Refusing to patiently wait on what God has promised. And again, one of the reasons that God took them into the desert is specifically because there's not much food in the desert. When it looks like I don't have what I need, it becomes clear what I think about God. Where do I immediately go to? Let's fast forward now into the first century. And there's a connection now. We're going to see here Jesus being led into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. There's a great connection to this Old Testament wandering of the Hebrews there as they were led out of Egypt. We see Jesus, and Jesus, of course, has been born. He's grown up, and the Spirit of God leads him out into the desert to be tempted by the devil. Jesus is out there. He doesn't have food for 40 days, and he begins to be hungry. And the devil comes with the first temptation. What is the first temptation? It's food. It's food. And this is no accident. This is by design. A Hebrew reading this story about Jesus would immediately see the connection to what happened in the wilderness, would immediately understand that there is a lesson that is being taught to us here through Jesus about what had happened back in the wilderness. Satan says to Jesus, I want you to turn the stones into bread because you're hungry. What does Jesus say? He elevates God's promises. He elevates God's word above his hunger. He trusts the Father. He trusts not just what the Father has said, 
but he trusts who the Father is. Matthew 4, 4, Jesus answered, It is written, man does not live on bread alone, but every word that comes forth from the mouth of God. Now, you know what's interesting about what Jesus is saying here? You know, Jesus is quoting somebody. You know who he's quoting? He's quoting Moses. These are the exact words that Moses said to the Hebrew children. The exact words that he said to them. Jesus is showing this connection between this temptation in the desert and what happened in the Old Testament where they wandered there and they grumbled about not having food. Here now we have Jesus showing us how to live this out. We, we have Jesus modeling what they should have done in those Old Testament times in trusting God, trusting the Abrahamic covenant, trusting the promises of God, trusting the words that have come out of God's map. Jesus shows us the right way to do this. He holds God's word above any need for food or for anything else. The promises of God, the words of God, based upon the integrity of God, the goodness of God. He elevates all of that above his simple need for food. He understood that his father wouldn't let him go hungry. He's saying they should have understood in the wilderness that God was not going to let them go hungry. They should have understood in the wilderness that he wasn't going to feed them manna forever. Jesus shows us how to simply trust and wait upon the promises of God, trusting in the integrity of his word. And this patient faith is not just, I'll say it again, not just trusting in what God has said, but it's trusting in who I believe God is that he will do the right thing for me. And so we've looked at the Old Testament wanderings. We looked at Jesus and his temptation in the desert, and we see connection there. But we also go a little bit farther down the road, and we see Jesus teaching his disciples to pray. Jesus gives this simple model of prayer. In Matthew chapter 6, verse number 9, listen to what it says. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven, give, we have, have also forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Did you notice the, the first personal request in there? Did you notice what it is? Give us this day our daily bread. It's food. It's the basics of life, the most simple basics of life, called here the daily bread. Give us our daily bread. Now, many scholars believe that this, that this term daily bread is a reference that goes back to the time in the Old Testament where God had given them manna. Manna that rained down from heaven and was on the ground. And in the morning, they would come out and they were able to gather some of this manna. And this was called their daily bread for the Hebrews there in the wilderness. And the point, the lesson that is being taught here is simply this, that as we look back at that story about the manna, and I believe Jesus referencing this in our daily bread, going to God and saying, God, not just give us our daily bread, but we trust you. For our daily bread. That prayer is not just an example of what to ask God for, but it's an example of what to trust God for. Everybody say amen. Because as we remember, we go back to that story of manna. You remember how that went, that every day God gave them a certain amount of manna. And they were to go out and they were to collect enough just for one day. Now, on the day before the Sabbath, they were to collect two because they weren't to work on the Sabbath, but most days they were just to collect enough manna for one day. Why did he do it like that? Because he was asking the people and he was teaching them a lesson. 
He was asking them, when you go out to collect that bread, that manna, that daily bread for one day, what you are saying is this, that you are trusting me, that when you get up tomorrow morning, I will have put more there. Because what would have happened would have been, if you came and, and shoveled it in and got five days of manna, first of all, it's going to turn wormy, but if you got five days of manna, what you're saying is, I don't trust what God just said. God told me that tomorrow there'll be more for me to go out there and get, but I'm going to get five days because I don't know whether I can trust what God is saying. Now again, what that is saying to God is not just that I don't trust what you're saying, but it's saying I don't trust you. And so this story of the manna and Jesus' reference to daily bread is simply saying to us that we need to be a people that not only ask God for the things we need, but trust Him that He is a good God and we will fulfill those things that we're asking for. The third, I'm going to give you three takeaways this morning that you can take home with you today. The first one is this, that God may, and I say may, God may put you in a situation where you don't have what you need. Now hold on, don't get up and walk out. Because there's a reason for this, and you know this by your own life. And we know this by looking at the biblical characters in the Word of God. There are times where God will put people into a situation, He will allow them to be there, and it will be difficult. And it will feel like this is not right. It will feel like this is wrong. It'll feel like I don't have what I need. But that is by design. Just like by design, he took them out into the desert. Why? Because there's not much food in the deserts. And God will sometimes take you to a place where it feels like you don't have what you need. But there's a reason for it. The reason is to reveal what is on the inside. What immediately happens when, we, when things are going great, it's easy to say, I trust God. God is a great God. I love God. I am just so happy to be walking with Jesus. When things aren't going great, what happens? Does complaining come up out? Do, do, do we get discouraged? Do we wonder what in the world God is doing? Or do we come to that place of peace? Remember what I said at the beginning, it's easy to have peace in front of the Christmas tree with a hot chocolate. It's harder when the winds are howling. But the real peace is when the winds are howling. Because it's in that moment that when we can, at that point, still say, I trust what God has promised. Because I trust who God is. There's a settled peace down on the inside. So God may put you in a place where it seems like you don't have what you need. And when you get into that place, remember what he has said. We mentioned it at the beginning of this message in Romans 8, 31. What then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things. Everybody say amen. amen. If God cares enough to allow His Son to take on flesh and feel pain and die for the sins of the world, why wouldn't He care about other aspects of your life where you're hurting and you have need? The answer is, of course He does. Matthew 6.31 says, So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first the kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you as well. And so the first takeaway is just simply this. God may allow you to be in a place where it feels like you don't have what you need, but that is only an opportunity 
to see what is on the inside. And if there's anything that needs to be corrected, it's an opportunity to correct it. Because where we should be is trusting in his word and trusting in his integrity no matter what we see around us. The second takeaway is this, that he hid a Christmas promise inside the Abrahamic covenant. And some of you have heard me teach on this before. You go back to that time when God has called Abraham out of his people and he's called them into a place and he is saying to Abraham, I'm going to make a covenant with you. I'm going to make an agreement with you. And he gives him those incredible promises that we were talking about here this morning. He promises that there's going to be a people that come from him. He promises they're going to be a great nation. He promises that they're going to have a land. He promises that they will be protected and that they will be blessed and that they will eventually be a blessing to the entire earth. And so God brings Abraham out into the wilderness, out into the darkness in the middle of the night. And he has told Abraham to take an animal and cut it in two and put its sides apart and let the blood pool in the middle. And we have taught before, and you know that this, that this was how they cut a covenant. There were people in that day that they would make great promises, strong binding promises between each other. And they would cut that animal and the blood would flow in the middle. And then both of the people that were making the promises to each other, they'd walk through the blood. And that blood would be a warning to them. That blood would say, you better keep your promise. Because if you don't keep your promise, this animal that's been cut and torn and bloodied and killed, that's you. If you don't keep your promise, that's how serious this covenant is. And so God says to Abraham, we're going to do one of those. I'm going to cut a covenant with you. <clears throat> As Abraham cut the animal, <clears throat> blood is there. God shows up middle of the night in a burning torch. And this is what happens. It was only God that walked between those pieces of animal. He never asked Abraham to walk between the pieces. And what the Lord was saying to Abraham, this is the promise. This is the Christmas promise within the Abrahamic covenant. God was saying this. He was saying, Abraham, I'm asking you to obey me. I'm commanding you to obey me. But if you disobey, and if the people that come from you disobey, you are not walking through the blood. Only I am walking through the blood. And so God is saying to Abraham, even if you fail me, Abraham, I will not fail you. As a matter of fact, I will take the punishment that you should have had. I will be the one who will be cut and torn and bloodied and killed. The problem was is that God could not bleed. He could not feel pain. He could not die. And so the only way that he could fulfill that promise to Abraham is if God would become flesh, Emmanuel, God with us. And what this illustrates to us this morning is this, that no matter what God promises and no matter how hard it looks that that promise, how in the world could that promise come to pass? God will find a way to bring that promise to pass just as he did in that instance where he took on flesh, hung on a cross, and took the penalty that should have been Abraham and all the children of Abraham and all the people of the earth, God will find a way to fulfill his promise. The third and the final takeaway is this, that Christmas is a promise within a fulfilled promise. What do I mean by that? I mean this. I mean that the birth of Jesus is the fulfillment of an ancient promise that God would become flesh, that Messiah would come. A promise to redeem His people with His own blood. And for thousands of years, the people watched and they waited for the coming of Messiah. Advent means coming or appearing. And so during this season, we celebrate Advent, we celebrate Christmas, we celebrate a fulfilled promise that God said 
He would come. God said Messiah would come. And there on that night comes the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Christmas was this anticipation of the fulfillment of God's Word. But also embedded within the fulfillment of God's Word in what we know as Christmas, we have another promise. And that promise is His return. Jesus promised that He would return. And just as people down through the centuries waited and waited and believed that God would answer His promise, or fulfill His promise of His coming, we now, on the other side of this, in just as strong a way, anticipate His return. Amen? Christmas speaks to us this morning about not only how God came to save us from our sins on that Christmas morning, but it also speaks to us about His promise that He will return to receive us to Himself. Jesus says, do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God, trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms, and if it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you may also be where I am. Would you stand together?